I just think take take the leap. You know, so long as you manage your risk correctly, it can be really life-changing, I think, actually. So, Nathan, you started off as a biologist. So, so help me out here. How did you go from being a biologist to an acquisitions entrepreneur? God, we're going back quite a long time now. So, uh, well, I, I studied molecular biology at university. And as part of my gap year, I sort of worked in the NHS in research and development. Um, and part of what I did for my department was I, I purchased things. So I was on the purchasing side as well. So I used to buy things like cleaning consumables, you know, wipes, that sort of thing, just, just, for, the, just for the lab and stuff like that. And I noticed that the, everything was incredibly expensive. So this is probably, this, like I say, this is probably... 16, 17 years ago, something like that. I um, I'd, I'd buy, I'd buy something and realise that oh, there's a big monopoly here for companies that supplying the NHS. So one of the things that happened was I, I think I was buying a fork or something silly, and it was like four quid or something, and I was thinking this is outrageous. So I started looking into it, and actually there were no smaller companies on NHS frameworks, so you know agreements to supply the NHS. And I thought, well, how hard can it be? So I sort of went off, knew the lingo. I'd worked there, obviously, a little bit as part of my sandwich year at uni. And I bid on an NHS contract and, and, and I won it. So this was me at university, my final year, won a share of a £39 million NHS contract. <laughs> Didn't have any money, Jonathan. I was a student. And so I had to scramble around looking for investors, people that could help me. Obviously, I knew the product and the and the technical aspect of the product but that's where it ended so I sort of scrambled around to find investors did that got some people on board that had worked in the NHS as non-execs and fast forward a few more years and, and I ended up selling that business to a chemical supplier who wanted to get into the NHS and vertically integrate and then I thought oh this is good and realized that the money was in selling the business you know, more money in selling the business than the whole than actually five operating. years of operating. Well, it's business. funny you should say that because my, my very first business, two and a half years of operating it, made more money when I sold it in those two and a half years. That's lesson right, yeah. lesson learned very quickly. And you also joined the, the, the long list of entrepreneurs who started their business out of their university dorm room, as they say in the States, but uh, halls of residence here right, in, yeah. in, the, in the UK. <laughs> yeah. I'm thinking of Michael Dell as a, as a very... Uh, famous one with Dell Computing. So that was your sort of your first taste of of business and what it could do for you. So that that was like a 5 year sprint that that part of it. What happened next? So I thought, well, this is this is good. I'll try this again. So I started an, another business, won an NHS contract because I thought maybe this is where the value is and then sold that business with not much trading but the contract and realized right this is this this is where i need to be not as much money that time because it literally was just a contract uh, sold it to some stakeholders i was working with at the time and then sort of did a bit of consulting for some of the companies i'd worked with and then realized this is a bit boring so fast forward another couple of years and i thought well hang on a minute i've got the resources let maybe i should start to invest so i invested in a few startup businesses probably invested about 150k before i realized this is very slow the returns are, are, are sort of not there you know this is a very extrapolated thing that i'm working with so i thought well what about acquiring businesses you know surely I don't have the resources for that so speaking to some of the lenders I'd worked with in the past it turns out that it was possible as you'll know and so started doing that on a very small scale so buying companies that were two three four hundred thousand pound turnover and then quickly sort of added value to them in order to be able to then sell them so either a buy out of whoever's working in the business after I bought it or a, some sort of trade sale or integration with somebody else and then realize yeah this is this is really cut down the amount of time it takes to invest and then produce a return a realizable return yes in a period that makes uh, sense co compa compared to a startup compared to investing in a startup or starting something myself so started doing that a little bit more the pace of deal making sort of increased took on more a deal team built a deal team all kind of coming up to today so last year i think we spent about eight million pounds on acquisitions a gross value of business purchases some of which we've exited some which have gone very well some which have not gone so very well and that's basically all we do now is we buy and sell businesses so we're kind of like a quasi private equity firm where i'm the only investor so that's how we kind of present ourselves and yeah we're doing very well so we i think we employ about 100 people now 
across Fantastic. the UK. So it's just and that's hundred people in the, in the businesses in the businesses that that we've acquired. Very yeah. nice. Yeah. Okay, now that's great. You're, and 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 you're saving jobs, creating new jobs along the way as well. So let's talk about some of those deals. So maybe you could pick out a couple that would be the most interesting to viewers and listeners. One of the first businesses we bought was a consumables business, so similar to the one that I sold right at the start. So I thought oh, I'll get back into the area that I know quite well. So we bought that for a very low purchase price. I think it was like two hundred thousand pound turnover, and we, we I think we paid about eighty thousand pounds for the business. We try and obviously conserve our resources, so we we try and put as little equity into the deal as possible, which makes sense. That's what everybody does, and that that one was particular, albeit a small deal. It was particularly good. So I think there must have been about ten thousand pounds of equity that went into that deal, which subsequently over the following sort of month or two we you know gained back through the profits okay, of the so business let me so. just say that uh, differently just so that everyone is very very clear in what you did here so uh, business 200,000 pounds of of annual revenue you effectively bought it with putting well you did buy it with with 10,000 pounds of your of your own money but then you were able to get that money back out so it was a, sort of a cash neutral that's uh, right investment. yeah right yeah. Yeah, within about a month. The rest of the purchase price was made up of a little bit of cash at bank and some asset finance, obviously increasing our return on investment, which is what you do. Another good deal, which was particularly large, was a acquisition in the Northeast. So we bought a warehousing and distribution company. We spent five and a half million pounds on that acquisition. And I think the equity into that deal was probably around 200,000, So, which, which was also made up of paying for the fees of lawyers and legals and things like that, stamp duty. So that was a good deal, funded mainly through a freehold property, which was in the business. Again, a bit of asset finance, being careful not to over leverage. And again, you know, within a short order, we earned back the money that we put into the deal originally. So over that time, build up, built up some very good relationships with tertiary lenders and now a couple of private backers that I've got. Those were the two noteworthy deals which were particularly good financially for us as well as, you know, the ease of doing the deal. So, yeah, th- those those were those were great so deals. So what what are your criteria in terms of 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 sector, size, location? So our criteria now, we've we've sort of sharpened our criteria, become more focused. So we look at the transport and infrastructure sectors, so things like warehousing, distribution, commercial property, haulage, anything to do with infrastructure and moving things around, basically. So we're, we're focused on, on, that, on that sector currently. So I've got some clients yeah. in my groups that are, that are doing right. exactly that. So I know a little bit about yeah. that, uh, yeah. that, that sector, which is, uh, which is a great sector, by the way. If you want to find out how to buy a business successfully, get your free business buying toolkit. The link is in the video description below. But what are the characteristics of the sellers in those sectors? Do you, are you looking for a particular type of seller? Not necessarily, although sort of 99% of the sellers we've worked with, it's been retirement sales, yeah. So it t- which typically is the norm. Nothing that we've bought has been up for sale, so we don't use business brokers. We... We have our own internal comms that we do to to lead generation effectively. So I've got a full time team that just do that, so that propagate deals. So in answer to your question, yes, we we target directors that are looking to retire. So certain age ranges, demographics, sometimes geography, if it makes sense, because obviously the idea is to buy things to fold into existing empire. So geographically, yeah. so, that's important so, for us. Yeah, a five hundred yeah. mile distance might not always be the most Wouldn't convenient. Make sense. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so we tend to look for things that that, that are strategic now. Okay. No, that yeah. sounds good. That sounds really good. We both share a, a reticence around using brokers, and I always say to people, for your first deal, you never use a broker because they are going to outmaneuver you. They have more experience than you. They will outnegotiate you. They know the process better than you know the process because you're just starting out. Later, when you've got more experience, maybe it adds to your deal flow, especially if the broker comes to you. But the majority of the people that I work with are doing exactly what you're doing, which is going out to the vendor directly rather than using an intermediary. So so what are the clear advantages to you of, 
of doing that? Well, I think you control the narrative. I think that's important. Mm -hmm. We obviously display our credibility, so it's not the credibility of a broker. I often use the phrase that brokers tend to be the graveyard of selling businesses. I know that's quite extreme, but if you look into a lot of business brokers' success rates, they're in the single-digit percentages of actual sales and completions that they do. So that was another reason. Often overinflated ideas of value through business brokers. So like estate agents, if I'm a business broker, I want to win your business, Jonathan. So I'm going to say your business is worth 10 million. I can sell it for 10 million. You pay me a, an exorbitant listing fee. I put it out there and I'm like, well, actually, Jonathan, people are willing only really to pay 8 million for this business when they knew all along that people were only sure. willing to pay 8 million for this business. And often an advantage for us as well is uh, with retirement sales, people tend to have a figure in their head that they want to retire with that is just completely detached from the value of the business anyway. Yeah, exactly. So, it's, it's how much so, do they need to pay off the mortgage, uh, buy the holiday home, exactly. uh, and buy the new car, and, yeah. and buy presents for everyone. That's yeah. right, that's right. So so that figure, wonderfully, obviously in all the cases where we execute a purchase, wonderfully kind of matches with what we believe the business is worth. So that's another advantage of, of going direct. Yes. And and all the communications direct. So all the guys that are on my team with the with the experience, they can, you know, build a rapport with the seller. It's not through somebody else. You know, and 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 obviously the broker works for the seller. So they want to get as much money as possible and we want to pay as little as possible. So oftentimes I find the easiest way and the most effective way is to have the seller build ownership around what that figure is. So work with them to come up with that or at least me show them how I've gotten to that figure sure. so they're happy with it. So and it's then a collaborative process. As yeah, absolutely. To a, it's uh, got to be. Yeah. Here's, the, here's yeah. the deal. Take it, yeah. take it or leave it. To Pick up on something you said earlier, which makes a lot of sense, is you want to you know, make the very best use of your resources and therefore minimise your cash into, into the deal. And I think any sensible business person would want to do the same. Yeah, Why, why, why put in 100,000 where you could put in 10? I mean, you know, there's really no, no comparison, is there? But there's always, there's always someone who says, well, that's absolutely outrageous. How dare you try and buy that business without putting your own money into the deal? You need to put your house on the line, Nathan, in order to buy that business. And some people are very vocal about this. I mean, I, I've, I've been trolled consistently by people who, who feel that, that it, you, you as the buyer should adopt so much risk. What's, what are your feelings about that? I obviously look at it from my perspective. Obviously, us as a business, you know, I need to protect my business, my employees, future and the sustainability of the business. So like you say, resource management and allocation is really important. I think it's important to see it from both sides. So I understand. I mean, I, I have had personal guarantees on purchases before. I'm not going to say it that I haven't. You know, there's been deals where we've put more equity in than I'd liked. But, but you know, I like to think we've got a suite of lenders now that we work with that understand what we do, more, mm -hmm. most importantly, and, and are willing to help us. Um, and, and oftentimes, there, there's, it's, it's not happened to me a great deal, but sometimes you'll have sellers that don't like that as well. So they'll say, well, hang on a minute, you're, you're, you're paying for the business with the assets in the business. Yeah, you're, you're, well, you're, you're buying the business with my own money. Yes, <laughs> yeah, but, but it's, it's, it's the same as buying a house, right, isn't it? You know, you, you're paying with the house that you don't yet own. You're getting a mortgage using on the, the house that you don't own. The collateral to buy, the exactly, yeah, yeah, it's just in this situation. And no one complains then. No one complains, uh, Because no. really, if you're selling your house and you get the money that you want for your house, does it really matter where the money comes from? Just like when you're selling a business, who cares where the money comes from? It, you can still spend it regardless of its source. Exactly, yeah. Plus, in the situation of a business, obviously, there, there'll be sometimes some earnouts, some deferred payments, which obviously saves capital. Uh, being obviously responsible with that, of course, making sure the business can take on the added stress of acquisition debt or acquisition finance. Um, but yeah, that's that's sort of how it works. They are my, they're going to be my assets in the short future, so I can borrow off that in order to buy it. It's the same as anything else. And obviously, you know, there are parts in there with warranties and things like that. So I can say, well, I don't want to give you the whole purchase price because if I do that and something goes wrong, I ain't going to be able to catch you to say, right, give me some money back. You know, so we always hold some some back, you know, 20, 30 percent at least, yeah. you know, for things like because, enforcement of warranties. And because warranty like claims yeah. are very difficult. Are they? Yes, they uh, are. And expensive. They are, yes. Yeah. So always better to have some sort of 
right of offset as, a, as opposed yeah. to trying to make a, a legal claim. So, so I think we're actually on the same page, aren't we, with um, with with our belief about uh, about how that should be done. Um, I I talk to a lot of people about how larger deals are actually easier than smaller deals. What's your experience? So we're spending the same amount of time, the same salaries on the deal team, the same legal fees often for a deal that's 500,000 as opposed to 5 million. So if I'm looking at a return on investment in terms of a return on spend, the bigger deals are the better investments. And like you say, oftentimes, a lot of the lenders we work with, they've got minimum lending anyway. Of course. So, you know, where I'm I'm saying I want to buy this business for 200,000, well, our minimum lends a million. So why are you not doing bigger deals? bigger deals so that's kind of where we've progressed it's been a obviously a, a desire to progress in terms of the size of deal but also the lending criteria as well yes and, and yeah it's a lot easier to get that yeah. larger lending oh, or yeah. the smaller lending exactly. because yeah. it's not worth their while no. as lenders no to to do everything that needs to be done to 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 put in a very that's small right, amount yeah. as a loan yeah. i mean everyone wants to know about the things that don't go right as well as well as the things that go right and and to be fair you can often learn a lot more from the things that don't go according to plan than you can from the things that are absolutely textbook. So have you got any war stories? Yes, you can share yes, with us? I do. So I've got a couple of war stories. So I've I've had acquisitions that have gone wrong. I've actually been through an insolvency process as well before. So I've I've seen what happens when it goes wrong, particularly if you over leverage or if you don't do enough due diligence or if you don't hold previous sellers to account when things do go wrong. Mm-hmm. Um so yeah, I've had my fair share of experience with that, particularly with enforcing warranties, uh, which is where offsets are incredibly important they really really are and the cost of legal fees you know i've had pgs called upon you know and and so i've kind of almost had the works really (laughs) but but this is this is what makes anyone who they are isn't oh yeah it's it's having that well-rounded experience not just because if 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 it's like every deal is the most amazing deal you've either not done enough deals yeah or they're all exactly the same with such low risk you can't you can't help but be a hero every single time. Yeah. Buying a business is a roller coaster, which is why you need a lawyer who knows what he is doing. So why not use mine? His name is John Andrews, and you can find his contact details below this video. So what tips would you give people, let's say their first acquisition, based upon your experience, the positive and the negative, what would you, what sort of tips would you give? I think never be too careful on due diligence, obviously, which seems like an obvious one. I'd say getting a bit more technical, I'd say use SPVs quite liberally. So I think, I think in terms of compartmentalizing risk and cross corporate guarantees and whatever else the lender might throw at you, you know, build a group structure that might seem too much for where you are, but actually you can grow into it. Um, it's interesting how many accountants talk my clients out of doing that. Yeah, They say, you don't need a, a layer of SPVs. You've got a holding company. You know, you, you, all those accounts will have to file. There's a cost attached to that, you know, and they try and talk my clients out of it. And they come, the client comes to me and says, what do I do? I said, no, go back and tell the accountant that, that it's, it's your neck on the line here. You need to compartmentalize that risk. You've got to do it this way. Otherwise, you you're going to come a cropper at some point. Well, I mean, a perfect example, I obviously don't want to go into the specifics, but I mean, what, extra £500 a year per SPV, something sure, like that? Exactly. You know, if uh, you know, there's been a situation where if I'd have had that extra layer, you know, sort of mid-co or whatever, if you want to call it, that extra £500 a year would have probably saved me about £600,000 in, in costs later through insolvency. So... You know, it swings and roundabouts. So, yeah, there is an extra cost, and I'm very happy to pay it. <laughs> I've, I've, so, I've, I've seen similar situations, yeah. absolutely. And no one ever regrets setting up the corporate structure correctly. You absolutely do need it, you know, especially for selling as well. So if you want to break something off and sell it, or there's a buyer that wants this, doesn't want that, if it's laid out correctly, it's very easy and tax efficient as well. Yeah. So, so a situation that we've seen on many occasions is where you've got the trading business And you've got the property, the real estate that the trading business operates out of in the same company. And then you've got to demerge it and and get the HMRC clearance to do that. And it just adds an extra layer of complexity on the deal. And expense. And expense, which no one really needs. And if it had just been set up correctly. And and that's usually, uh, in fact, I was 
talking to a, a, another podcast guest earlier about how terrible so many accountants are and, ju- and, and lawyers as well, actually, as it happens. But accountants can give absolutely terrible advice and everyone trusts their accountant, but I don't think they should. I, th- I think if, if people stop trusting their accountants and questioned their advice a little bit more, everyone would be better off. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't go as so far as to say it's terrible, more lazy. I think okay. it's, yeah. I, I think yeah. it's, well, we're going to have to do this and do that and I'm going to have to charge you for it. And, and actually, you know, you get a good commercial solicitor, they'll do it all for you anyway. The accountant that does all of our books for all of our businesses, I actually own a stake in that accountancy practice. So I invested for that individual to actually come out of her job and start her own practice because mm-hmm. I thought I need somebody close, someone who's a friend, someone who understands what I do and, and actually is going to be dynamic. It's working in your best interest. Exactly. So so I actually got into bed with that as well. So that's been an incredible boon as well. So actually being a being a stakeholder in that business or a shareholder in that business gives you a certain leverage, doesn't it? And oh, yeah. you know, she's not going to mess you around <laughs> as, no. as you are also a partner in the in the business that's right yeah so that that's been an incredible help so yeah we just just try and sort of vertically integrate try and in you know try and consolidate all the nice buzzwords we do it all give us some more tips then some more acquisition tips things that you've picked up that 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 you can only know if you actually do this sort of thing lots of theorists out there but people like you and i who've done it only people like us would know systems processes i think when you in the first sort of 40, 50 days of purchasing a business, the first couple of months, you need to get acquainted with the systems. In fact, there's a lot of stuff you should probably do pre-transaction. Like, for example, some simple things that have caught me out in the past where just not being able to access my own bank account, you know, and it's still the previous owners who are now in Spain and I can't contact them. So I think really nitty-gritty, granular minutiae of the deal is important uh, because the devil's in the detail so i think things like that getting your processes right you know visiting the business getting under the skin of the business meet everyone get all the keys you know i think the little things are what trip you up especially when you when you've got this grand vision as an entrepreneur people do you know but they don't think about the detail and i think that's quite important you know you need to be able to to get into the premises and things like that i've had situations where i made it a rule that i always change the locks and then you forget your own rules, don't yeah, you? Yeah. And you, it, it's just hassle and it's just, oh, do we really need to change it? And the locksmith's quoting a huge amount of money because it's a special type of door or lock or something and you don't do it. But I've had situations where the seller who is exited completely is letting themselves in at the weekend. I mean, is that not sort of, that's a little bit I've, freaky, I've had it? that, I've had that. <laughs> and I've, I've had sellers come in at the weekend and actually take stuff they thought was theirs. I've caught them on their own security cameras and said, well, hang on a minute, is that lawnmower yours? So, we, we had someone go in and take the office computers. <laughs> really? And it's like, and they say, oh, well, it's, it's my computer. No, 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 you've sold the business. You can't take the computers out because without the computers, we can't operate the business. Exactly, yeah. No, it's, it's really funny. We've had all sorts of stuff. It's the post-transaction stuff, I think, that can trip most people up, especially people that haven't done it before. So the business owners that have only ever run their business and they're buying another competitor for the first time or something, that's, that, that's usually what I think trips people up in my experience. What advice would you give to someone who's been thinking about buying a business for a while, they're looking at starting a business, What would you say to the person who's just sitting on the fence? I think get some good advice. Don't just trust anybody you speak to, like with the accountants. And I think, I just think take take the leap. You know, so long as you manage your risk correctly, it can be really life-changing, I think, actually. For business owners as well, not just for people that want to quit the corporate life. I think business owners that want to grow inorganically, I think it can be really game-changing for their business. So why not? I mean, just read a book or, you know, watch a video or something and just clue yourself up and just do it. You know, just contact people. Mm -hmm.